Hello and welcome to Won't Be Forgetting That, a podcast talking about all the most awkward and embarrassing moments that's happened to people working in the arts and entertainment industry. I'm your podcast host, Seb Muirhead, and today we have a guest. They are an actor, a writer, a director, George Kemp. Hi, Seb. Thanks for having me. No, thank you so much for coming on, mate. I do want to say as well, for a a little bit of a peek behind the curtain to all the beautiful perverts that listen to this, (laughs) you're my first ever Sydney-based guest. I'm up in Sydney in a dank little hotel <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a word yeah yeah yeah, yeah. look I'll, I'll, well, I'm not going to be staying here at the time of this release don't stay in St- City View Studios <laughs> and if I regret saying that I'll edit that out later <laughs> hopefully it's good for sound I think we'll be fine yeah I think it's quite bouncy for sound so again if the sound quality is a little bit funky as well my apologies <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on um George. Now, you were actually recommended to me by friend of the show, Paul Westbrook. Uh, yes, Paul yeah. Westbrook. Yes, yes. And uh, I'll be honest, I was a little trepidatious at first. Uh, <laughs> I'm also going to ask, was that the correct use of trepidatious? I think so. Yes, cool. Thank I'll God. Go with it. Right. So um, I was like, okay, I'll look you up. And I was like, fuck, you've done quite a bit of stuff, man. I'm quite <laughs> impressed by the old resume there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But um, we'll start off. You studied back in, uh, is it Central School of Speech and Drama. Yes. yes. Uh, so I think it's called, I think now it's Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. Oh, is it? I think. Did I get a knighthood? Yeah, I got a knighthood. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, just before the Queen died, I think. That was her last act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. She got the sword out on the building. And then it was finally, she was like, no, my work is done. That's right. Uh, yeah, I went to Central in London, um, but uh, Sydney, born and bred. And, yeah, um, nice. Before that, I went to uni and did a theatre degree at a place called Bathurst, which is like three hours oh. west of. Of Sydney, um, and it's this amazing course that I think might just not exist anymore, which is a huge bummer because oh, wow. it's um, this amazing kind of really broad theatre degree, uh, and so they kind of cast the year of you know sixteen to eighteen students oh, as sure. a kind of like a bit like a company. So there's yeah. there's people there that are you know really into acting and there's some that want to be directors and there's some that want to be oh, wow. lighting designers or stage managers or writers or whatever um and so it's really broad and you find yourself doing like you know fire twirling and oh no shit out in the oh, bush and stuff sick. like that it was the best um and then it's sort of like in this in this uni town about three hours west of sydney yeah and so it's like you know living with all your mates in the same suburb and and you can't escape as well because you're in the middle of fucking nowhere that's right yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um but it was great so that that was really great kind of like grounding in theater you know like knowing yeah, nice. what lights are called and all that kind yeah. of stuff that's fucking handy as yeah. well isn't it i always say this whether it's theater or you're working in tv and film actually knowing what the fuck's going on because you're like so much of acting school is like you study the character and you get into it and all this crap and you turn up on set one day and you're like who the fuck are all these people totally. and it's the same in theater as well you're like Everyone's dressed in black and running around in the like behind the scenes. What's everyone doing? Yeah, and it gives you a sense of like what everybody else does. You know, yeah. the fact that stage managers have been there for you know two hours before you have, and they leave two hours after. Exactly <laughs> right. Know? And they've it's seen good. one million shows as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like a it's a really good like ra- you know well rounded kind of theatre training. Yeah, that's awesome. And then tried to get work after that for a while. You know, did bits and pieces, yep, yep, all that yep. kind of stuff. And then randomly on a on a total whim, a yep. uh, friend of mine um, said, "I'm going tomorrow to like audition for this drama school in London. Do you want to? I don't want to go by myself. I'm nervous. Do you want to come with me?" So you went. Sorry, were you in in Sydney? They go Sydney like Sydney, and you. Oh, so they they tour. Like, sorry, they come over here to audition. Yeah, you didn't just go to London the next day on a whim. No, no, no. no. I've got you. I've got <laughs> Not you. that go much on. of a whim. But they yeah they go to like San Francisco and like, oh like, shit. Mumbai and New York and they go to all, uh, Singapore. When and, like, I auditioned for that school, I f- flew down from Edinburgh. Why couldn't they come up to <laughs> yeah. Edinburgh? That would have been way easier. They should have. Um, but yeah, and so they came to Sydney and my yeah. friend was like, do you want to come along and audition? And I, I think I had like a, I don't know, a speech in my back pocket somewhere. I must have. Oh, that's the classic. It was, yeah. like, everyone had three or four monologues yeah. all the time and I was like, I've not used a monologue in so fucking yeah. long now. <laughs> so I was lucky and then I went along and did this audition and then... Um, um, a couple of months later, I got this email saying, come to London and do this master's degree. Holy shit. Um, so I was really lucky. And it was this perfect thing because it, after this really broad thing in Bathurst, yeah. it was like, you know, a really conservatoire vibe of, you know, Pretty really on, huh? hardcore acting training. Yeah. Um, 
which I absolutely loved. I had a really, yeah, really great time. Um, yeah. Did you stick around in London after that then? Or just... I did. I stuck around for a year, did a whole bunch of plays, did a, you know, an Othello above a pub kind yes. of thing for what a while. What a fucking London thing to yeah, do, right? Yeah, it was good fun. Um, and then did a show where I was, you know, basically like a glorified extra in this amazing nice, um, play nice. at the Hampstead Theatre. And Ooh, it was shit. like... Tams and Greg and Ian Glenn, like these oh, like wow. crazy, you know, UK names from Game of Thrones and yeah, like right? books and stuff. And so, and it was just like thrust into this this little new kind of Chekhov short, like a Chekhov short story play kind of thing. Oh, cool! Um, and it was a thrill. It was really fun. Oh, fuck yeah! So I stuck around for a while and then came back to London uh, to get my visa renewed. Like, so oh, I did a student yep. visa, came back here. I had to get my visa renewed, and while I was here, I had a um, like a, a meeting with Sydney Theatre Company here. Oh, just DC, like yeah. Sydney Theatre Company. Yeah, I went and um, had a yeah meeting about a play they were doing, and it was just like really bizarre, quite awkward meeting with yeah. the casting director there, who I didn't know. Oh, and she just would kind of you know like. She was lovely, but she would just ask ask a question, yep. but then not a- ask any kind of follow up questions. And so oh. it's awkward. So her dog's running around in the office, and she'd sort of oh. say like, you know, when when did you finish at Central? And I'd say, oh, like, you know, last year in September, and that, that was, was it. it. Like okay. no, like follow up. <laughs> like that's it. That's the whole answer. I don't wow. know. With, like um, an interview, or just like a yeah. I think she's just, just like sort of looking me up and down. Yeah, just sort of sussing me out. Um, wow. But then she said, you know. Uh, I was going in for Romeo and Juliet. I was oh, like, yeah. Because, oh, uh, you know, Central was all Shakespeare stuff. Um, and she's like, yeah, probably look nothing for, for Romeo and Juliet. But um, And then I said, what about they were doing another play called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Oh, yeah. And so I sort of floated that idea because I knew there was a character in there that I could kind of maybe have a, have a look at. Yeah. She was like, oh, that's an interesting idea, yeah. And then that night... I ran into a friend of mine at a different theatre yeah. in the foyer who was already cast in Rosencrantz at Guildenstern. Oh. And so I told them about that and they were like, oh, that's a great idea. I'll email the director, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then didn't hear anything for ever and ever and oh, ever and ever. Course. Went back yeah. to London, forgot all about yeah, it. Yeah, right. And then got an email. Um, they, actually, they actually said, can you send in a video? Oh, fuck um, yeah. Uh, because we're worried that you might be a bit too old to play this character, Alfred, who's okay. uh, the character that dresses up in all the dresses and Shakespeare. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, and so I took this kind of like big swing and uh, I put together a video of me doing Viola's monologue from Twelfth Night because at the same time I was playing Iago in, oh. um, in oh. London. So I had this big beard yeah, and I was doing a checkoff play at the same time. And so I was like, oh, great. How am I going to not look old with this huge <laughs> beard? And um, so I sent this video off of me doing Files and Monologue and my beard was my disguise. And I just had these visions of them, you know, like sending it around the Sydney Theatre Company office being like, who is this? Absolute loser. I guarantee <laughs> you, know? you, you're not the worst video they even got that week. <laughs> so it was all just one of those really lucky, like, timing. Yeah, fuck, um, that's so you cool. You know, running into my mate at the theatre that night. Yeah. Like, it was all just really one of those weird timing, who you know, kind of. Oh, my God. Sometimes um, it's like that. And, and sometimes it's six years of nothing. And then it is, like, the most, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's an important thing that happens to you, but then that's what gets you the work as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that's why I fucking hate this <laughs> job. What are we doing? Um, but um, yeah, that was a long answer too. Yeah, no, uh, and no, so then I came back from London. I came back to do this job at, in Sydney and then yeah. I, I stayed here after that because it just made sense to kind of try and ride that oh, wave a bit. Sure, and yeah. then not, you know, go back with six months left on my visa and oh, of come back broken homeless yeah no no that's the actor's uh, dream right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> continued work not broken homeless that's it that's the actor's reality i think more that's so it. but um yes enough about all of your fantastic and amazing work we're going to move on to the awkward and embarrassing stories that <sighs> i presume we've well i mean we've all fucking had it in this job yeah um because it's just embarrassing yourself until you're one time it works out mm-hmm. um the one thing i do want to ask though is you actually worked on or in a play where everything is meant to go wrong that's um, right. aptly named the play that goes wrong <laughs> that's it yeah so um, how did you find working in something where I mean obviously it's very well rehearsed and choreographed but where a fuck up can be disguised as part of the show <laughs> maybe opposed to somewhere or something where it's even like a, a Sydney theatre company where it's very I, I presume regimented in the respect of like you can't accidentally trip over and be like oh that was intentional entirely that's the weird thing about these 
these goes wrong shows because the play goes wrong and Peter Pan goes wrong. Yep. And it is, so those plays are, you know, really heightened, theatrical, comedic, um, really quite kind of like violent slapstick farces. Yeah. <laughs> or you maybe even want to explain as well for, for people, I mean, if you don't know what this is, how dare you? But <laughs> just in case anyone doesn't know what the, the goes wrong company is. <laughs> yeah. So it's these, it's these guys uh, from the UK, from yep. London, and they wrote this play called The Play That Goes Wrong. And they yeah. wrote a little short one act thing um, that they were doing in a pub in London. Yeah. And uh, it's a, the play that goes wrong was about a, a, a company um, called the Cornley Polytechnic Society. Yeah. Um, and it's a bunch of amateur actors trying to put on a murder mystery called The Murder at Havisham Manor. And uh, while the actors are trying to put on that play, every single thing that can possibly go wrong goes wrong and stuff falls down and, yeah. and stuff catches on fire. And, <laughs> and like, it's, like, it's full on. Yeah, I mean, it's technically amazing, the show. Yeah. Like, the actual like fucking million things that have to happen for it to make it look like none of it was meant to happen as well. Yeah, and it it, it is. Like, it's it's really so, so... The thing about those plays are that it looks like total mayhem, yeah. but it is so so deeply st- structured and yeah. um, it has to be so exact, but purely just because uh, not to kill us. <laughs> like, well, that is also preferable as well. Yeah. And most work, I find, not dying is, is I yeah. mean, good. But was that more stressful in that case thing? So it always meant to look like fuck-ups, but well, actually we, fucking up would be way worse if yeah, you did we, fuck up in it. It's really funny because the audience, if, if things did actually go wrong, yeah. the audience you really lose them. Like the oh, audience wow, okay. really, it was really interesting. A lot of people say that thing of like, it's fine if stuff goes wrong, but it just means we lose the audience because the audience w- want the actors to have that control. Yes. You know, they want yes. They want to feel safe. They don't want the actors to, they don't want really to think that the actors are in danger. Yeah. You know? um, but when we rocked up to, you know, the first day of rehearsals, there are all these crazy things that happen. Like in Peter Pan, there's a set of, like three bunk beds that all just collapsed down that, on top of each other. When I watched that, terrified me. It's like, yeah. I'm like, how are they not dead? <laughs> it's so and, weird. And there's a bit when one of the characters comes through a door yep. and a, a light falls from the lighting rig and just yeah. hits the deck. And that's like a show light as well. So these yeah. massive like metal things, not just a light bulb. Like it, those things are huge. It was crazy. And so we got to rehearsals and, you know, everyone kind of was saying like, you know, what's the what's the trick? Yeah. And the, the directors are like... No, you just you don't do stand it. Under yeah, it. Just don't stand under it. <laughs> yeah, just don't put your hand out uh, like under the bunks. Um, so it, it's really stressful in that way. So there's always yeah. this part of your brain that is just really like a self-preservation part of your brain that's ticking over. Yeah. At the same time as you know the the comedy part of your brain that's trying to make everything tick along perfectly yeah. as well because it's just you know beat after beat after beat and if you miss one then it really, you know, it's really hard to, to claw it back again. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh. But I had the, probably one of the worst things that's happened to me on stage was in that play that goes wrong. Oh my God. Well, this is the perfect fucking segue into the it, stories in that case. Here then. we go. Yeah. Um, but it was the, actually the very, I think it was the very first preview. Oh, good. N- nothing good happens in previews. Yeah. <laughs> if um, nothing happens in the preview, that's a good preview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was the very first preview. And there's a bit in the play where my character, I play the the actor that plays the butler. Yes. And not the brightest, tool in the shed, yep. can't remember any lines, has lines written on their hands yes. that are like written down wrong. Um, and there's a bit in the script at the end of the first act, just before the curtain comes down for interval, um, where the characters are sort of doing, the, it's a set piece where like yep. the, the lines go all out of whack and it's my character that is forgetting their line. Yes. And so because I keep forgetting my line, it flips back to kind of like, you know, 16 lines earlier and yeah. we do it again. And then I forget it again. So it flips back 16 lines and it goes again and it goes again. It happens about eight or nine times. Yeah, and right. it gets like faster and faster and faster each time <laughs> so that it's like breakneck speed. Yes. Like it's really fast. We're talking really fast. We're, we repeat the blocking every time the, the lines yeah, go right. back as well. And at the end of it, the there's two characters on either side of my character and they have a glass of water in both their hands. Yep. And so I turn to one of them and one of them throws the water in my face and then I turn to the other one and they throw the water in my face because they've realised that it's me that's fucking it up. Yes. I haven't realised yet. And on the first preview, we've done it for weeks and weeks and weeks in rehearsals. Yep. First preview, uh, I turn to the first person, the actor beside me, who's going to throw the water. Yeah. 
and I'm speaking and I, I, I must have opened my mouth too much or something and the water goes in my mouth Yep. and I just choke. Like, oh, so straight into the lungs. Absolutely <laughs> straight down into the lungs. And it's, oh. that, it's actually that full on, not just like, oh, goodness, but like, uh, I'm going to die. Yeah, right. <laughs> and making Jesus. this like horrible sound <laughs> that where I'm like. <clears throat> so you just got waterboarded, essentially. Waterboarded. Yeah. It's exactly what it was. And so I couldn't, like, I couldn't speak. So of the course, whole yeah. like rhythm of the whole thing is just completely messed up. Yep. And the actors don't know what to do because I'm making just instead of my lines, I'm just making this horrific just noise, death, death screams, <laughs> yeah, in a death spiral. And so there's nothing that can happen. So the curtain just like slowly <laughs> comes down as I'm like writhing around, <laughs> Holy one, shit. Like my whole life flashing before my eyes. And then we just hear the audience kind of like clapping and cheering and stuff. And they fully just think that it's, like, part, part of, of the it. show. While I'm, like, backstage, literally with two stage managers, like, hitting me on the, <laughs> me on the back, trying to get this water out. And it was just, like, such a blindside because everything, yeah. you know, you're thinking about a bazillion things, especially in a show like that. And so then to just have this near-death experience... From what seems like one of the safest things in the play as well, like I, I throwing up. I, I mean, honestly, I was expecting them to like let go of the cup or something like that. But yeah, yeah. from it just going straight into the just old, the old lungs. Hazard. Yeah, nice. Oh, our microphone started to escape from us there. No, no, not you. It's also falling apart because of this hotel room. Everything's <laughs> just a little bit sad in here. Um, but yeah, that's like impressive from how bad it goes wrong, but also. Like, I mean, is that ironic for the play that goes wrong where it's the one thing that seems like it can't go wrong does go wrong? Yeah, there's yeah. something there. You're right. Like, there's bits where, like, I set stuff on fire. There's a massive explosion. There's bits yeah. where the whole level of the study collapse. Yeah, like, there's entire parts of the set yeah. that fall down, eh? The entire set falls down at the end, but not. It's just a simple um, simple glass of water to the face that nearly Did you keep it in after that? <laughs> <laughs> Every time I got to that bit, like, from that part onwards in the, in the season, yeah. I was like, oh, God. I'm mouth closed, gonna... mouth closed, mouth closed. Yeah. <laughs> mouth closed, eyes closed closed that seems my nose. so stressful that part as well from like pretending to forget your lines but then resetting but then having to have that specific timing for it as well it was fascinating those shows are really like they're, they're really a bit of a comedy masterclass yeah because getting to do them for so long you you get to tr- try little bits and pieces and yep. just kind of like that comedy muscle of you know i i love being a kind of um you know a bit of a like comedy detective or scientist yeah. or whatever. And like, what is exactly, like, why is this moment working and that moment's not and all that kind of stuff. And so at, at the end of that sequence, yeah. actually, when I do, if I, when I was not choking yes. <laughs> um, and doing it properly, I finally realised that um, it's me that's that's got it wrong. So then yeah. I say the line really loud uh, and, like, put my arm in the air and all this kind of stuff. And when done well, I, yep. I realised that if I did it and I, I held my breath at the end... It would get a round of applause, right? And I, if I didn't, and I kind of like released that tension yeah. a, a millisecond too early, nothing. It's so funny like, how the audience reacts to that kind of stuff as well. Because I've done a bit of kids theatre too, and I always find if the kids are getting a little bit like too raucous at any point, if you just go, <gasps> yeah, and then like that's such an instinctual thing for a, a kid to start listening again. Whereas if you're just like trying to match their levels, it kind of just escalates a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, like it's that kind of that, that little bit of like, I don't know, stage magic or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. It's just minuscule. And it's just really fascinating to see how, you know, a group of a thousand people can all behave in the same way. I know, right? With the m- most minuscule of like changes to a, a beat or something. For if somebody was watching it as well, they'd just be like, no, I didn't notice anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's yeah. just those little things. I mean, noticing that, but then having to perform everything at the same time as well. It's like, fuck, it's a lot. But it's also why you spend five million years in acting school and <laughs> five million dollars on acting classes and that That's kind of it. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh, yikes. Moving on from that. Anyway. <laughs> so I know that we also came in with some other prepared stories too. Um, the way I usually like to get them told on, or ask to get them told in the podcast is kind of keep the most salacious ones to the end so we keep all these beautiful perverts listening until the end <laughs> did you have any particular way that you wanted to tell them or if you had any like chronologically or um, if you did want to save 
Any of the most harrowing ones till the the last part? Yeah, I got a bit of a harrowing one that was a, that was a Peter Pan Peter Pan goes wrong one, but oh, we can yeah, save yeah. that for the end. No, if that's you nice. Like. We'll start with the play that goes wrong. We'll end yeah. with Peter Pan that goes wrong. Great, and then plenty of other things that go wrong in the middle as well. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Did you have any ones from early on in the career? I always find that so many um, stories come from people studying at drama school. Totally. Uh, yeah. Even before that, I reckon. Like I have, like I was thinking about it on the way here. I reckon there's a moment that I can pinpoint when I was maybe six or seven. Oh wow, that might be the <laughs> earliest story we've ever had in the podcast. Then, and it's not even like it's not even a really interesting story. But yeah. I think it's like if I was. If if I think if Freud came back to life, yep. uh, he might be able to kind of pinpoint this as a as a as a starting point. Oh, he just draws a big X on your yeah. life timeline and he's like, "This, this mm-hmm. is what happens here." Yeah, right. And it seems so innocuous, but I when we're at school in like year six or year seven or like no, like six years old. Yep. Oh, six this, year. Yep. This thing called show and tell at yes. school. Yes, we had that back in Britain as well. You'd bring in your favorite book or toy or whatever. Yeah, totally. And I remember so vividly this student bringing in, uh, they'd been to some, like, Formula One or, like, some drag race car oh, okay. racing thing over yep. the weekend. And they brought in these pictures from it and stuff, these, like, crazy fast cars. Um, and that was kind of a new concept to me. Like, I hadn't really, like, seen that before. And at the end of their little speech that they'd done about seeing these really fast drag race cars... Yeah. Um, the teacher said, you know, anyone got any questions or anything at all? And I remember putting my hand up and it wasn't even a question. I just yeah. made a statement <laughs> oh, nice. where I sort of said, you know, wistfully, like, imagine if your brakes failed in one of those things. <laughs> and there was just like c- crickets from the class. Yeah. Like, not that it was funny what I said at all. Yeah. But I just remember this feeling of just the 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 energy being sucked out of the room <laughs> Everyone just kind of being like, what the fuck? Like, and just nothing. No reaction. Were you just trying to tell a joke? Silence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not at all, I don't think. But I must have been in my mind, like, yeah. expecting some sort of reaction or something. I don't know. And just nothing. And I reckon that it was just this moment yeah. of, like, for the rest of my life, my Freudian psychology yeah. would just be like, well, I'm going to... I'm going to prove that wrong. They're going to get like, <laughs> they're going to get crickets again. Oh, so this was the inciting incident for I the rest so. of your performing career. Then, yeah, I think it's just set me off on this path of like big, broad yeah. theatrical comedies. Like, to well, just I'm going to make sure that everything I tell from now on is a joke. <laughs> get back at these like six-year-olds that didn't appreciate. Um, I swear to God, that's where most people. My not funny joke. <laughs> that wasn't even a joke. Life comes from like a trauma from that age, which seems so innocuous from like to so many people. But then you're like, no, no, that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Yeah, not a single person in that room would have any recollection of that moment happening whatsoever. Yeah, but it's uh, it's it's taken me to where I am today. I'm pretty convinced. That's fine. Fucking deafening silence is yeah. so hard. Awful. Like, and it's I've had we've had so many um, stand-up comedians on the show as well. Where mm. I'm like, you must get that a lot being a stand-up, especially early on in the career. But I was just like, I couldn't imagine. Like, I mean, as a kid as well, it fucking sucks. I mean, it, it you do so much embarrassing stuff as a kid, but like, yeah. when you're really trying to get reactions out of people, even as an adult, totally. Like, oh, just anything, just booze would be fine. <laughs> like anything. anything, anything. Yeah. And I remember my mum telling me this story when she was in a play at school. Yeah. Uh, and she was in Joan of Arc, and you know how they sort of teach you like a group scene, like a school play, oh, and yeah. it's kind of like say rhubarb, 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 and that sounds like crowd murmuring, just murmuring in the sound. background. Yeah, yeah. rhubarb, rhubarb. And my mum has this really clear memory of being in Joan of Arc. And it's this bit when they've got, like, Joan of Arc tied up to the stake. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just before she's burned alive. Yeah, yeah. pretty hardcore, I think, for, for, for a kid's girl's play. school. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're like, rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. And then they're taught to, like, yell out certain words. So yeah. they're like, rhubarb, 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 witch. And like, <laughs> rhubarb, 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 burn her. And my mum's friend goes, rhubarb, 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 rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> My mum just remembers again, silent, you know, this yes. silence of, of an audience. And it's a really powerful thing that just <laughs> stays with you for the rest of your life. I bet I that kid was remembered by everyone else, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was a strong choice. I do not understand why, but I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, that. as a kid as well, like, 
your life is school essentially so I'm sure you would have got bullied <laughs> relentlessly afterwards on the playground for being like it's the rhubarb kids totally yeah totally um, so yeah and then I just from then on I've been in big <laughs> brash bold comedies I think there's a link between yes. the two I yes. reckon and I presume right. from then on every single joke you have told has landed now and has oh, always had massive rapturous applause and laughs yes. of, course, of course that's how it works for all of us just in case anyone's wondering that's right yeah that's right hello now not to interrupt all of these wonderfully awkward stories but coffee on cue is back at it again introducing the coffee on cue filter coffee brewing pack your ticket to enjoying these embarrassing moments with a perfect cup of coffee this incredible kit includes a two cup v60 pour over filter brewer matching filter papers and 250 grams of their ethiopian guji single origin coffee specially roasted for filter brewing. This is the gift for the coffee drinker in your life. Or for an office Chris Kringle. Or anyone that says, oh, I don't really want a present this year. And the best part? Well, we've got an exclusive offer just for you beautiful perverts. Head over to www.coffeeonq.com.au and that's Q-C-U-E right now and use the code WBFT15. That's WBFT15 at checkout and you'll score a fantastic 15% off your purchase. So whether you're brewing up awkward stories or sharing a laugh over a cup of delicious filter coffee, the Coffee on Q Filter Coffee Brewing Pack is here to make every moment extra special special and that will happen with your wbft15 percent discount so don't miss out on this incredible deal and the opportunity to give the perfect gift this holiday season visit www.coffeeonq.com.au and use wb15 for your 15 percent discount and start embracing the awkward one cup of coffee at a time <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I did lots of. I did a play, uh, uh, I think called Pop Up Globe. Oh in, yes, very um, like well known, famous. Um, like, is it all over the world? Where is the pop up? Yeah, they are a New Zealand company. Yeah. so they started it in Auckland and did it. Um, built this incredible replica of you know Shakespeare's Globe in a yeah. car park in Auckland. Oh, did they? Wow, I didn't know that's where it started. Yeah, and it just went bananas. Like yeah. they just sold so well. Um, and so they did a, a full season there of of kind of four plays. There were yep. two companies of eighteen actors, and um, they would do two plays in in rep. Yep, uh, well, four plays in rep actually. And so then they did another season the next year um, that went to Melbourne. And so it, yeah. it was in Melbourne for about six months. Yeah, um, right. And just again went went crazy. Like I think, like I went to go and try and see it a couple of times, and it was sold out so often. Mm. And I was like, I didn't know like this was a thing, let alone like how insanely sought after it is. Yeah, yeah. it was wild, and it just was really cool to see because um, you know Central was that Masters was in Shakespeare, and so yep. it was just really cool to see audiences in Australia, especially getting so into these plays. Yeah. And, you know, I did Henry V in As You Like It. And we had a, a show that happened to actually be on St. Crispin's Day, the famous speech in Henry V, yeah. of Henry V. And it was, you know, 900 people on a summer's night in Melbourne. Yeah. A lot of whom were teenagers. Right. And they were just going wild. Like, during the battles, it was like yeah. a rock concert. Like, all the actors came off stage and were like, I have never experienced anything like that in my whole career. Like, For whatever reason, Shakespeare, and I don't know, nowadays seems to be think of, like, as boring and you sit there silently. But, like, back in the day, people were, uh, like, going mad for it and, like, hooting and hollering and, and, like, cheering and jeering and stuff like that. That's kind of what was encouraged. And getting drunk. And getting drunk as well, <laughs> right? There was, like, nothing else to do. Yeah. And it was great that it was it was so you know that's what these plays are written for is to yeah. involve this audience that yeah. is in the daytime back in the day you know? exactly. so you know being able to like ping lines to certain people in the audience and yeah. um, really involve them that way and it's not like a you know proscenium art where they're yeah. sitting in a theatre and with their program and they're silently and they're like hands oh, folded oh, oh, sorry I just accidentally knocked my glass together I'm sorry totally yeah. people were heckling and yelling stuff out and yeah right falling around the place <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah it was really wild but it was just really exciting to see that kind of um, happening but 
you know, behind the scenes we had about 30 odd actors, you know, Shit. all staying in the same hotel room oh. down by South Bank. Oh, and yep. so there were times where it felt a little bit like a kind of 24 hour job. Because <laughs> yeah, you was can't like, escape, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And actors from all over, you know, like actors from Central and from Melbourne and from Sydney and from New Zealand oh, and awesome. from America. Oh, and fuck yeah. So it was a bit of a, a kind of carnival vibe. Um, but because it was just so kind of big and brash as well, it would just, there were times when it would get a bit loose or something would yeah. happen. And I remember being in a production of um, As You Like It. Yep. And it was this big camp, like um, camp version of, all male camp version of As You Like It. Which would have been, I don't know about the camp version, but like all male cast would certainly have been back in Shakespeare's day as well. Totally. Yeah. Um, and we had this, moment at the end where it's like the big group wedding yeah. that happens uh, and everyone's getting married and in As You Like It there's this character called Hyman who comes and marries everybody yep. it's like this weird <laughs> moment <laughs> it's just this like a almost like a god that comes through whatever Shakespeare has a few little bits like that yeah it's like- it's yeah, pretty random. We just finished everything up now. <laughs> yeah, wrap yeah. it up in a nice group wedding. And in our production, it was this actor um, dressed in like kind of, kind of like an angel, like in oh, all okay. white with like sandals and oh, very ethereal wings. Yes, and they would actually come through the roof, and oh, so shit. they would like be lowered down into the wedding from yeah, wow. from the roof of this building and just sort of like hover like you know ten feet above the wedding. Holy and, shit! And they would just like pick from their back so like for anyone that doesn't know at home like a lot of the time with that stuff you'd wear a vest underneath and a rigger would rig you up in the back and you'd sit down or uh, fly down on that or were they sitting on like a seat or anything coming no, down no they just would like rig through a harness yeah wow those things suck yeah, yeah. <laughs> to spend too long in them those things suck yeah yeah and so he would come down and then in, in the wedding it'd be like you know you and you marry you and you and all yeah. that kind of stuff and he like point to them and then we had this one show full sold out Friday night show yeah. and he starts to like come down through the roof and just get, just gets stuck <laughs> and doesn't quite make it far enough oh. so that no one the only thing you can see is these two kind of like hairy legs <laughs> <laughs> and a pair of sandals and a little like white skirt nice and that's it and okay. so then he's, <laughs> he's still the actor's mind like yep. ticking over and he's like, I'll just keep going. And yeah. so he's up in this part of the theater that is actually designed so that you can like make thunder and all those oh, kind of yes. like old school things. And so he starts speaking and already he's like opera singer. So he's yeah. got this crazy voice and his voice, cause his head is stuck up in the like really <laughs> in the like- Thunder dome. Thunder dome. <laughs> just booms out wow. of this thing and he's pointing at us with his, his like legs. little oh. feet his little sandaled feet and everyone um, like everyone in the cast has yeah. just lost their mind like it's just over by then like no one can control themselves oh, so, so everyone's just breaking left right and centre everyone's just broken yeah and this wedding's meant to happen and, but everyone just loves that stuff oh like, for sure when something goes wrong and then the, the performers roll with it I fucking love that it was just so much fun and then the flip side of that was you know, 40 degree Melbourne Ooh. heat that was, you know, and the, one of the costumes I wore, I played Catherine in Henry V. Jesus. And so I, this costume I was wearing was like 20 kilos. Yeah. And there's bits where, you know, people are dead after the uh, battle or whatever, and yeah. lying on this wooden surface in the direct sun in Of course, because it'd be during the daytime as well, and you're just getting battered by the sun so for anyone that doesn't know the globe's a big circle as well so the top doesn't have anything over it Mm-mm. oh and there were parts where I honestly felt like I was just lying on this thing wearing all this woolen costume oh my stuff that was God. meant to be really period correct and everything and I felt like I was just an egg just boiling from the inside <laughs> also like those costumes don't get washed all the time as well so I was like I've worn a few costumes like that. I've like, I've ruined this costume. I don't know how you're going to clean this now. Yeah. Just Horrific. sweating so much into it. Horrific. But yeah. it, and, and it was just a long season and it was a long, hot time. <laughs> and so by the end, things were just kind of... Falling know, apart. I remember seeing at the different levels of stage where you could come yeah. out. So there was like the, the main ground level and there was another balcony and then there yep. was a balcony above that. And I, uh, I remember seeing an actor asleep in the kind of you know makeshift green room 
and and their cues coming up. Yep. And like, I remember them he- hearing it and seeing them jump, like jump start up. Yep. And now, oh my God, that's my cue. Run to where they think the door is, but it's actually the mirror next to the door. Oh, and just no. go smash back <laughs> straight into, into the it. Mirror. I mean, that's yeah. quite funny. <laughs> yeah. it's hilarious. Um, but it was a bit of a like, uh, yeah, a rough ride towards yeah. the end. Well, but- it's when you're like, for those kind of shows as well, when you've done them so many times, you're not going on automatic pilot necessarily, but you're like, I can do the show whilst I'm asleep. Yeah. <laughs> like, genuinely. Totally. So you either find yourself, like, find things to entertain yourself with, or you do start to get slightly complacent and have a little nap here and there as well, and <laughs> maybe let things slide, which wouldn't necessarily slide at the start of the season. So I totally get you. And 30 people as well, so many. Yeah, it was a really big company. So it was... um. But yeah, it just went wild. And, like, you know, people, because also people could Instagram it and people could take oh, photos and videos right. and hashtag it and everything. It would just became a huge kind of cult thing. And, you know, I'd get things in my Instagram of people that had, like, made my costume, like, wow. made my costume that I wore and, like, taken photos of themselves in Holy it and shit. stuff. And That's like, amazing. Yeah. And you, again, you just think, oh my God, Shakespeare is, you know, for these 17 year olds that are doing this thing or whatever. And adults too. Yeah. Um, it just really hit some sort of... Yeah, right? ...nerve or something. Well, I think it's what people will want Shakespeare to be like a lot of the time as well, because there's a few Shakespeare companies around Australia and Britain as well, which just keep putting on the same boring Shakespeare all the time, and you'll get the 60, 70-plus crowd in mm. uh, consistently, but fuck, it's boring to watch sometimes. Mm-hmm. And everybody grows up with Shakespeare in high school, which everybody hates as well. I, I did personally, for sure, because you're just like forced to read it. So I think that's what people just think Shakespeare is a lot of the time. Totally. But for them, people that actually like it, you can have fun yeah. as well. And then you find the company that's doing it that you like. And you can dress up as one of your favorite performers and send them weird, not weird DMs, but that's right. That's also going to what it leads me on to my next question as well. Since with that kind of stuff, um, do you ever find people reaching out to you afterwards as well? Because with some of the bigger plays, like with the the Goes Wrong series or even the Pop Up Globe. Do you have a lot of people reaching out to you afterwards? Pop up globe, definitely. Yeah, like, yeah. It was, yeah. People just it really hit some sort of nerve, and yeah. we we did a show um, that was the same uh, night as the plebiscite happened. The same sex oh, marriage right, plebiscite yeah. happened, and we kind of like you know skewed the show a little bit towards it because the, as you like it was you know really camp and there were lots of yep. all male couples in it and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that just went wild. And then after that night, I got so many, um, so many messages from people oh. on Instagram, um, kind of saying how much that meant to them, oh, and fuck yeah. um, you know how they never kind of really got into Shakespeare or anything because of that stuff. You know, yeah, it can be yeah, so yeah, heterosexual, sure, huh? it can be so whatever, and so it kind of turned it on yeah. its on its head in a in a production like this. Really, kind of actually meant stuff to people. Oh, that's so nice. Which is really nice. Yeah. I've um, never had a nice Instagram DM. They've always been really creepy. <laughs> I mean, there's the creepy ones as well. Yeah, but cool. um, I like to remember the nice. Yeah, no, that's felt. good. That's good. I, it's my life. That's once. maybe not true as well. I have had a few nice uh, DMs too. But like a lot of the time when people come and see you in plays, I, you get some creepy things. Do you get you them? Have you got like weird ones? Yeah, yeah. Because I've I've done like a, a fair whack of different kind of plays, but um, especially the ones where. Uh, like you taking your clothes off and or, or any nudity, people get a little too excited with that. I think because like you can see it on screen and you like it's on screen, but like when it's real in the room, people get a little too excited sometimes and they'll follow you on Instagram and send you messages consistently afterwards, being like, "When's the next play? You're in, you're naked," and I'm like, "I oh, probably shouldn't return this message to you." <laughs> it's bizarre. Isn't it, it is, isn't it? Yeah, and it's also like, like I, I get it. Whatever. Everybody goes to theatre for different reasons, but I'm like. I don't just do theatre to get naked. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there's also other theatre as well. Yeah. But... The non-naked theatre. Yeah, I know. But th- that's not what the- a couple of specific people have been interested in. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it goes to that kind of intimacy of theatre as an art form. Yeah. You know, like it's like people, it's different, as you said, to seeing it on screen. But if somebody sees you, you know, naked on stage or whatever, there is a like a- an assumed intimacy there. Yeah, right, isn't it? Because you're sitting in a room with 200 people. And yeah. it's like, that's a very select, small crowd depending on how close you're sitting to the performers as well, they're like, they can be like six feet away sometimes. Yeah. And you're like, wow, like I can understand why people get excited by it. 
don't send the performers things afterwards. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know if that's a controversial opinion, but yeah. I think the intimacy goes one way because they can see you, but yeah. you can't see them. So I also don't know uh, who they are as yeah. well. <laughs> so like just getting these random messages afterwards. And you're always like, every now and again, I don't know if you're the same, after a show, you'll get a little bit of a bump in a social media <laughs> media following. And I'm like, oh, I've got a few extra followers from the show. That's so fun. Yeah. But then when it, they don't even follow you and they just send you a message and you're like, oh, <laughs> gross. <laughs> yeah, I I've been pretty lucky with the with the DM content so far. Okay, well, anyone listening just now, we will be giving George's uh, Instagram <laughs> yeah, out. No, I'm open. Yeah, yeah. George Peter Kemp. That's is it? right. Yep, yep. So send them right now, and then do it again at the end of the show as well, if you can, please. <laughs> the most disgusting stuff you can possibly send. Please. Uh, <laughs> we need to skewer from good to bad, predominantly <laughs> for any of the messages you've got. I'm ready. But, um, that was also a joke for anyone that doesn't quite understand. <laughs> please do not send any of my guests inappropriate things or dick pics. <laughs> Send them all to me. Um, <laughs> but yes, moving on from <laughs> troubling things that I'm saying yeah. to more embarrassing and awkward things. So you've predominantly done um, theatre work, is that correct? Yeah, a bit of TV stuff here and there. Quite a yeah. few like TV commercials as well, which is a whole yeah. other... So um, my favourite thing to ask mm-hmm. is, what are your most embarrassing TV commercial edition stories? Because uh, they are always the fucking worst. The worst. Just sitting in a room full of people that look a little bit like you. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which like... all, like, you're all kind of making polite chit-chat, but you're also like, you're all, like, quote-unquote competition uh, and I can't talk too loudly because I can hear the people in the room so yeah. I, I, if I talk too loudly they can hear me obviously yeah and it, yeah exactly hearing what's going on in the yeah. room next door and then you going in to have to do like your version of that yeah and then you know especially after you know when you did like four years of training and a bazillion dollars know. worth and you're oh. like I think I can eat a burger like a normal person you can trust me but you can't <laughs> yeah, you can't Obviously that's not what can't. they want or whatever reason they don't want you for it and you're just yeah. like fuck man I had a thing last year where I was doing a, a, an audition for a TV commercial yep. for a, a car brand yes um, and I went in did the audition kind of nailed it like yeah, nice. which doesn't you know you, you always just go in there and like oh, I don't know roll the dice oh you my know? god I never like if they laugh I don't know if they're doing it out of politeness or not sometimes <laughs> yeah. when you can hear people getting laughs in the room before you go in and then you go in and nobody laughs yeah I mean hearkening back to your childhood story <laughs> <laughs> that's right worst nightmare and you're like what the fuck did I do wrong <laughs> Or if it's drama, if it's meant to be serious and they're yeah. laughing, that's always a weird thing. I'm yeah, like, I, thought I, was, like, <laughs> I thought I was acting. You're like, oh, I, uh, uh, th- oh what? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I went in, and I, the reason I knew I, I thought I'd nailed this thing was because I heard the director who was on Skype in New Zealand yes. or something. I, and I was leaving, I heard him say to the casting director, he was like, we found, we found our guy. It was like oh, a 1930s, like, that's you know, awesome. we found our man. Cancel everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, great nailed it so I, I went home and then I got an, a, an email from my or text from my agent yep. saying um, look they're kind of they they really like you the director really wants you oh, it's the but fucking the producers isn't it company yeah the car company is like look we're just worried again he's yep. a little bit old I think I'm going for the wrong things oh. uh, can you send them can you send me a photo of you with your hair styled like this yep. and he sent me this random photo okay and I was like Okay, that's really specific, but sure. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it when I get home. Yeah. And he was like, no, they need it now. And I was like, okay. Okay. So I go home, try and like dull my hair in this like stupid way. My partner took a whole bunch of photos. Yep, yep. Sent them in and they were like, mm, still not quite right. Um, do you have any photos of you with like shorter hair? Okay. And I was like, okay, this is a couple of days later. It's all yep. happening like a couple of days oh. break, a couple of days break. And then I was like, okay, so I went back, found a few photos where my hair was shorter. Yep. Sent them these photos. I was like, surely that's it. Done. Yeah. Done deal. And then agent calls back and was like, look, you're going to hate me, but oh. um, they actually uh, can't really figure out what you look like. So can you what get does- a haircut? <gasps> and I was like, I, I will look like the photos... That I just sent you. Like, or that's I'll what look I... like me in the room when they recorded me. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. And I was like, if they want to see me with shorter hair, look yeah. at the photos that I sent of me with shorter hair. Like, that's yeah. what I look like. And then another one, can you send me your hairstyle this way, but with a white T-shirt on? I'm like, surely they can what? imagine that photo, but with a white T-shirt. And then part of you goes, you know, you always go, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Because... 
they shouldn't win this battle, you know? But they have but the then fucking like, money and they always win the battles. I know, so I'm like, $20,000. Yes. Okay. I know. So I'm like an idiot, go yep. and book this um, haircut. Yep. Go in and they're like, after you got the haircut, can you just send a picture of you to the producers? Oh, the executive yep. producer, she'll um, send it on to the people. Yep. So I go in and get a haircut, have to explain it to the hairdresser. And oh. she's like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And I was like, I know. So she takes a photo of me oh. <laughs> my haircut. And I went, this is humiliating. And then said it. And then about a week later, they're like, mm, no, we've gone with someone else. Oh, my fucking God. Did they at least pay for the haircut? <laughs> yes, I'm okay, not sure okay. of it. Thank God for that. No way I wouldn't be so petty, but I was yeah. like, this has been No, no, I'd be so that petty. Annoying. I'm not losing money to audition for you. And I've already auditioned. I'm not losing money to fill your incredibly specific needs that's so weird it was just staggering and like the the lack of imagination in yeah. that part of the industry to me was oh, just kind of like it's exhausting huh? exhausting and it just makes you you know it's sometimes good to make you realize that it's actually yeah. nothing to do with you or how good you oh are or how God, bad you yeah. are or all that kind of stuff and as frustrating as that is it's kind of better that way than you know you were shit yeah exactly well i mean it's like I don't know about yourself, but walking out the room and hearing the director being like, that's our guy. I'd be like, all right, I've booked this. I've mentally started spending that money now yeah. as well. And then just to be absolutely fucking uh, made to jump through so many hoops is so tiring. And my God, just belittling as well. And you feel like such a dick and you're like, I'm a person. Like I have things to do with my life. Yeah. I'm, I've already obviously put these dates aside for you. Mm. And, why am I having to put a white t-shirt on and send you a photo now? Sometimes it does. It feels really like a one-way street yeah. sometimes in yeah, that right. way. And you just kind of get so frustrated with it all. Um, but, it, yeah, I mean, those TV commercials are, are hard to turn down. And you want to make a point and you want to be, like, yeah. brave. But then you kind of just go, oh, they're just going to give it to someone else anyway. And I can I really use that money. I know. And that's it as well, isn't it? Because you're like, so many of the TV commercials are so much of our income as well, which mm-hmm. fucking sucks. Yeah. I, I, The first TV commercial I did, I got paid more for that. You know, I, it, was, it was honestly three days sitting on a beach. Yeah for Aldi yeah and I got paid more for that three hours than I did for three months at the Sydney Theatre Company Isn't you know so like, f- like it's funny or it would be funny if it wasn't so sad mm-hmm. like it's genuinely what keeps us being able to work yeah <laughs> but like I had a TV commercial at the start of 2020 which luckily got me through the first year of Covid like super serendipitously as well because obviously we didn't know COVID was going to be so bad when we filmed it Mm. but it kind of worked out nicely as well because they couldn't film any more TV commercials so they kept rolling it over Mm. (laughs) but even still like I was just like how is this paid so well and I've done like I did a feature film earlier this year Uh, I was the lead in it filming down in Tassie for a month and I was like, that wasn't even a drop of what I got paid for that um, that TV commercial. And it's just crazy. so sad. And that was equity rates as well yeah. for the for the feature film. But anyway. How did like, you go in Melbourne over all the COVID lockdowns? Like how? Yeah, like, nothing awful, filmed right? pre- predominantly. Yeah, it was really hard. And that was the right at the start of when I started training to become a stunt performer. Oh, so wow. that was not an ideal time as well. But yeah, like it was, yeah, obviously Melbourne was the worst for all the lockdowns. Yeah. Um, and nothing filmed down there. But then afterwards, because Melbourne was so well known for its restrictions, loads of American productions came over because they're like, oh, Melbourne's doing really well with it there. So they brought loads of American stuff over, which was good. Yeah. But even just like really weird random ads. I auditioned for a couple of American TV ads, which were like, I think one was like for a detergent company and the other one was for like a, I think it was a car company as well. Yeah, right. But yeah, just like I mean, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd love to sell detergent in America. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly, I'd sell it anywhere. I'll be honest with you. But yeah, it was like obviously during the actual lockdown, so it was pretty fucking tough. Yeah, and it kind of has, still has changed the way we do stuff. Yeah, in terms of casting and everything, yeah. you know that it, you it was so long and still sometimes that you don't get in a room. Yeah, with a, a casting agent, and sometimes I found that so helpful to have somebody there to. Tell me what they want. Just give a vibe, yeah. you know? Like, I think I, I, I sent, another embarrassing story, sent a video off for a self-tape yeah. that I thought was for a, like, big kind of, like, piss take of the Marvel oh, kind of thing. Like, okay. the whole big superhero Marvel yep. vibe. Yep, yep. I th- when I, I got the script in it, you know, as you know, you only get a little bit of this thing. Oh. It's like breadcrumbs. And sometimes it's not even called this. Like, I auditioned for Preacher. I don't know if you know the TV right. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I auditioned for that. They gave me the fake name. 
years later I watched the TV show and I was like that's the fucking scene I auditioned for I didn't realise I auditioned for that show yeah but yeah so sometimes you don't even get the like the name of the production totally yeah. and so reading the script I was like oh this is a like I assumed it was kind of like you know scary movie yep. or that kind of thing yeah. making one of those of the Avengers thing which actually is quite a good idea I think yeah um, but they so I I put down this tape in my living room like that took yep. a massive big swing you know <laughs> okay took it like a piss take yeah. kind of thing and then just got this thing back from my agent being like that is not the, this is a real it was like a, the next Marvel movie like it oh. was like the real thing <laughs> and you just and I had just assumed from the writing yep. of it that it might not be like exactly well, that that's I mean somewhat in keeping with some of the recent Marvel movies I think yeah, yeah but and, but that's the thing when you don't have someone in the room there with you yeah. to be like hey this is what they're after hey this, this is a real tone. Marvel movie FYI <laughs> what are you doing you're just making fun of the Marvel movie yeah, yeah. so haven't yeah, got any more um, haven't got any more of those in a hurry because I think I think I took a big swing which was completely in the wrong direction yeah look we've all done that I'll be honest with you <laughs> um, I did one I don't know I signed an NDA for the audition, so I probably can't name what it was. Yeah. But it's a big Amazon um, Prime TV show. Mm-hmm. And I took such a swing because one of the descriptions was the, the character's a larrikin. Right. And I was like, oh, that means this and this. And then I, I sent it off and my agent's like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was like, oh, she was like, you were like one of three people who were auditioning over Australia for the role and oh. stuff like that. And I was like, oh, no. I... I, I haven't watched the TV show as well. I just can't bring myself to it. And I was like, well, I hope whoever got it, it was essential between him and one other person. Because oh <laughs> I completely took myself off the table with it. <laughs> it was, oh, fuck. And you just like, you think back to it and you're like, hindsight, 2020, man. But I'm just like, I fucked that yeah. so much. And the, yeah, and it's just because of COVID, it's still changed. Like, it's yeah. still like you're still not getting the room. Yeah, but a lot. if I did it in the room, they could have just been like, no, this is actually what we're after. Yeah. yeah. And that's all. It would have just been one thing and it would have fixed it all, but nah, fuck it. Ah, uh, who cares? I suppose. Move on. I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> fuck, maybe if they get a season two, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yes, yeah, sorry. We can start bringing the podcast towards a close now. Sure. Oh, I genuinely am. That's. I forgot about that for so long as well. Fuck, I'm going to be uh, thinking about that all night I tonight. I apologise for bringing no, it up. No, please, please. This is, I, I, I'm always so happy to share my stories on this because I, I, I say this so often as well. I bring people on. I generally admire their work as well. And I bring them on and ask them to exclusively talk about the worst points in their career. So <laughs> I'm happy to share my stories too. But um, so we can start bringing the podcast to a close. Did we have any other um, stories that we came prepared with? Or do we want to jump into the Peter Pan Goes Wrong story? I'll go Peter Pan. But it, yes. it, uh, yeah, it takes a turn because... Because it was so during the pop up, during the pop up globe, yeah, that kind of you know that that weather and that heat and yeah. that kind of physical nature of it, yeah. Um, a lot of people would you know the the budget for hydrolite must have just been like through <laughs> the roof because everyone people would faint, people would whatever, oh, I like, couldn't imagine, yeah, it was crazy. And so I think something like stuck in my brain and this like this connection between you know like being on stage yeah. and this kind of fear of feeling physically unwell kind of oh, thing. Oh, like, yeah, okay. And it just sowed this little seed in my in my brain where my brain would just make this link between, you know... Which kind of makes sense, right? Because you're, like, you're so used to doing it one way and you're yeah. like, well, this is just... I'm on stage again, so it'd be the same, obviously. Totally. Yeah. And my, body, my, my mind just kind of went, okay, you go on stage, you don't feel well. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. And it Ooh, started well, this, like... Ideal. Yeah, this weird kind of, like, anxiety cycle, oh, spiral shit. kind yeah. of thing. And... So then when Peter Pan and and when Peter Pan came up, I kind of that was in the back of my mind yeah. going, Oh, it's another big six month ordeal. Yeah. <laughs> like, ordeal. Really ordeal. fun ordeal. No, but no, like, ordeal is I think is very apt. Yeah, <laughs> it honestly is. I mean, like I we we would do I ran a marathon when I was fourteen. Yeah, right. And I could not even get you know, can't run around the block now. But like uh and I swear to God that these four show weekends of these goes wrong shows, yeah. that that's harder. Like it's physically more demanding. Than I'm not doing surprised. This thing. It's insane. Honestly, marathon is for you. The shows are for everyone else. So you have to give so much more. I feel like. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. But anyway, so um, my brain made this link. So when I was going to do Peter Pan, I was like, "Can I? Do I want to commit to this six month thing? If that happens again, yeah, with this little link that happens, this little anxiety spiral. Um, I don't know if I can like do that. Yeah. And so I kind of thought it through, spoke to some people, yep. all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. It'll be fine. And then 
we auditioned and we rehearsed in New Zealand for Peter Pan Goes Wrong. Oh, so cool. we did it like as well as Australia too. We did Auckland and Christchurch and Wellington, which was oh, so great. Yeah. I loved it. Um, and when we ended up in Christchurch, I kind of had been fine. Mm. Rehearsals was fine. I was like, oh, this is great. It was just a pop up globe thing. Like, yep. I'm fine. Um, and then we hit Christchurch after Wellington, I think. And it was this bit when I was like lying in those bunks that we were talking about, yeah, the three bunks that like bunk collapsed beds. down on each other. Yeah. And I'm in the bottom one. <laughs> and can I ask as well, like, obviously, you're in like uh, enough space in there that it doesn't crush you. Can you escape once that falls? Or are you just locked in there? You're in. Oh, my God. That'd yeah. be terrifying. It's a little bit buried alive vibe. Yeah. I presume um, you're not claustrophobic then? No. Thank God. I don't think. <laughs> um, but it's the anticipation of it. Because yeah. it makes this really loud noise. And um, the reaction it gets from the audience is just immense. And you don't want to put your fingers in there by accident as well. You'd lose some fingers. Totally. And you just, you know, you're putting the, the, your life in the trust of stage management and the people that kind of reset it. And, and whoever the fuck kind of built these bunk beds exactly. as well. <laughs> Travelled from somewhere in yeah, the West exactly, End right? to like Christchurch. Like, yeah. um, anyways, I'm like lying in the bunks, and I, I'd always get a little. I could always feel my heart rate just sort of go up a little bit while yeah. we're in those bunks because it, you just never know what's going to happen. But this show in Christchurch, I was like, uh oh, this is feels different to that. Oh. And don't worry, it's not a poo story. Oh my <laughs> God, damn it! <laughs> Sorry, it's no, not it's... as funny as a poo story. Oh. But it was this thing where I felt my heart rate going up I felt like I was getting sweaty and I had this full on panic attack for the first time in my life it was like a full on full on panic attack that I'd never had and it was that thing people say when they have them where it's like I felt like I was gonna die like it feels like a heart attack and so then I I sort of managed we've done this show so many times that I could be having this weird experience uh, this weird physical kind of experience yeah and at the same time continuing with the show like it was just this weird thing where it felt like you know that you say there's like um drone shots where people like on a cliff or whatever and yeah. it starts at their face and it zooms out out over the ocean or whatever and they yeah. become really small and that kind of thing it felt like that like it felt like i could see myself like an out-of-body experience it was a full like out-of-body experience i could see yeah. myself from further out in the audience and I could hear myself saying the lines well, and I could hear the audience laughing. That's good at least. Yeah. yeah. But I was completely having a full blown like panic attack and near death experience thing. Holy shit. And then the show gets even weirder where like we, Peter Pan flies through the window yep. and then the three kids, I was playing one of the kids and he teaches us to fly yep. and we come and get rigged up by these like things that go up into the rig and then we go to jump off the thing but instead the rig pulls off our pajamas yeah we stay on the ground yeah <laughs> and it's really funny but i just remember standing there like in my underwear having this full panic attack and the audience laughing and it was just the most surreal oh my god like out of body experience that i've ever had and i like came off stage and i had to like really quickly change into rollerblades <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's just the most it's like what am i doing like what is happening right now i'm changing into rollerblades yeah. as a mermaid while a thousand people are laughing and I feel like I'm going to die. Like, it was just so bizarre. And so I burst into tears side stage with the stage manager, like, holding my hand. (gasps) And, like, and then have to go on and roll a as a mermaid and then, like, keep going with the show. And then at interval, I just kind of, like, chilled out. So then I went and saw a um, therapist in Christchurch. I'd never been to see a therapist before. And was kind of talking about this whole cycle that was happening. And it's weird. It's not stage fright at all. It's just yeah. this weird little link that had happened. And went and saw this therapist, and she was really lovely. And um, we, I saw her, like, a couple of times, and I would tell her about the show and everything. Yeah. And then the next week, I go, and I do this bit, and my, like, clothes get ripped off, and I'm in yeah. my undies. And I look out into the audience, and I see this therapist in the second row. You're a therapist. My therapist. What? That I didn't <laughs> to. Like, that I'd like revealed all these like deep, dark insecurities about this moment in the show. And then I'm in this moment in the show and I look out and I see her face like laughing at me wow. in my underpants. Like it was just like this whole like psychological nightmare. That genuinely sounds like a nightmare. Like, yeah. like what people would have as a nightmare. Yeah. Like your therapist laughing at you whilst you're standing on your yeah. underwear on stage. It was bizarre. I That's so like... weird. Did you speak to that therapist again afterwards? No, I did didn't you go like... back? Oh, uh... I was like, I think we moved on from the tour. Like it wasn't yeah. that. I just went like we moved on out of Christchurch. And but... she didn't send you a message afterwards saying, "Hey, I love this." Or just... no. no, wow, that's 
That's so funny. Yeah. So we we loop back to my six year old self. Yeah. Being laughed at in class. That really has got <laughs> being laughed at by my therapist uh, with my underwear on. Yeah, right. So, God, that's so strange. Also, don't yeah. sit in second row. I feel like I feel like like if you had to come and see you, middle row. Sit why not? Back. You don't have to sit at the back. Yeah, just somewhere where the stage light isn't gonna sort of get you. <laughs> yeah, but it's so common, isn't it? Like that, like the you know the mental health in that industry. Not to oh. be a bummer, but like no, no, you you know when I when I decide I, I kept it to myself for a long time yeah. and then. When I decided to tell the people in Peter Pan, yeah, um, you know, and other things since then, yeah, almost every single actor is like, yeah, me too, me too, yeah, you know, like, which is, I don't want to say so funny, but like, it is such a prevalent thing in the performance space. But everybody has to put their best self forward all mm. the time, and then you kind of just go home and you're like, that's when every all your real emotions can come out, but nobody yeah. really sees that part. Something about the imbalance of like the adrenaline and yeah. that all that happens. I read somewhere once that you know actors, you, you you expend the same amount of adrenaline, you know, being in the play, yeah, that you do like in a minor car crash or something. It's like there must be something in that. That would kind make sense. Of, yeah, you know, imbalance of drugs in the mind that makes <laughs> something happen. You know, because it's we a also, weird thing. Yeah, we just constantly need to like. Not affection, but we need like the the feedback of the silence from drama, or like the the tears, or whatever, or the laughs from comedy. And you're like, mm. we need that, otherwise we've done a bad job. And you're like, yeah, sure. If you do a bad job in a cafe, it sucks. Obviously, <laughs> like I work as a barista a bit as well, and if I made a bad coffee, I feel bad. But I don't associate my life with that as well. But yeah. whereas an actor, like you kind of like that's what you're striving to be at all times and you're almost feeling like that can get taken away from you at any point. So if you're, if you've done a bad show one night, you're like, well, I'm a fucking terrible actor, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Whereas I'm, I make a bad coffee. I'm like, oh, I'm not a good barista. I just <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> like it's one of those Dilemma. things. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. just, oh, fuck, it's, oh, boy, I mean, wow, what a real bummer we finished this show <laughs> no, on. No, I apologise. <laughs> no, no, please. I, this stuff's always really important as well. And I think genuinely the mental health, um, um, I suppose, like, has come a lot more to the forefront of the performing arts industry. Absolutely. Uh, recently, for sure. And there's a lot more resources, which I, I don't have at hand, but I definitely would suggest looking out into them. Um, and then, like just the way that some people are treated and feel as well things mm -hmm. it's all moving in a positive direction not to say it's not still there anymore obviously. no but, but I, you do you feel like you're the only one that's going through those yeah, things you right? know but when you you know I was lucky that I was around this group of people that I trusted so much because we'd done the play before yeah. for six months and so it was great to you know get back get the band together again yeah but you know to be around people that you then trust and can talk about stuff like that yeah and you can you can go up to somebody and be like hey I'm having a shit day because yeah, right. of XYZ and they're like yeah it's fine you know rather than having to pretend everything's fine yeah and you're allowed to have a shit day as well absolutely like, yeah I still turn up and do my job but like, yeah I might just be a bit quieter or yeah. I might be like behind the scenes like yeah I might not just be as jovial as I usually am yeah yeah, but yeah well thank you so much again for coming on the podcast <laughs> no, no, no. I, I can only apologise for this room as well uh, whether or not I have edited out the name of the hotel at the start <laughs> but um, where can we find you um You've got uh, something coming up if you want to start with that as well. Maybe a, a little Yeah, I'm doing a lot of writing, actually, yeah. which I'm really, really enjoying. Um, and a play that I've written, which is an adaptation of The Nutcracker. Oh, fun. Uh, is about to go on at the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Um, yeah, that's so they, fucking awesome. Yeah, they play the music live and have dancers and an actor. And so I've written this kind of version of it that has a, an actor who's a narrator and two dancers. And, oh, awesome. Um, the ACO plays the music live. So it's really... That's amazing. Um, lovely, good time, good Christmas fun. Yeah, fuck yeah. yeah. Is that uh, got any tickets available left? I or? don't think it does. That's no, a useless okay. plug. <laughs> but it might come back next year. So. It's a humble brag in that case. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll link it just in case. Uh, I don't know if any more tickets they might do no, new shows maybe, yeah. or the, uh, additional shows. Yeah, so I'll link that in the, the show notes too. Oh, great. And then if people want to follow you as well, where can we find you? Yes, for all the DMs. I, yes, um, disgusting uh, DMs. Yes. <laughs> At George Peter Kemp. Yes. Because there's another isn't George it? Kemp as well, isn't there, floating around? There's an English one. Is there? Oh, is he English? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's an English one, which is why um, you had to change my name for a little while in London and then change it back when I came here because yeah. you can't have the same name as someone else. Yeah, that's so funny, isn't it? It's um, bizarre. Egg, is it Equity in Britain? I forget. Yeah, it's uh, Sp Spotlight. Spotlight is the, is the, the main um, casting thing, yeah. yeah. They won't let you have the same name as someone else. 
That's yeah. why a friend of the show, Paul Westbrook, mm-hmm. is called Paul Westbrook. He has a different real name. That is true. <laughs> yeah, and I think David Tennant's not David Tennant in real life so as well. So many of them. Yeah, so bizarre. But anyway, yes, yeah. sorry. <laughs> George Peter Kemp. Uh, Instagram, me on anything else? Uh, that's it, pretty much. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same as well, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, and then, have you got any other things coming up in the new year? Or just keep on the Instagram to keep an eye out for what's keep going on? Keep on the gram, I yeah, reckon. nice. Fuck yeah. Yeah. In that case, uh, we're the same as every week. Won't be forgetting that pod across most of the social media platforms. Myself, Seb Muirhead, M-U-I-R-H-E-A-D on, well, basically just Instagram as well, I'll be honest with you. If you did enjoy the show, I say it every week, but if you could do it, it'd be really appreciated. Rate five stars, write a nice review. Hell, write a horrible review, but review it five stars. Uh, <laughs> it all counts towards interaction and the social media stuff. Um, we have started up a little Patreon as well to basically just keep the show running um i would like to stop losing quite as much money on the show if i'm honest um, so just any little uh, is appreciated i know it's fucking tough time out there just now so if you can't afford it that is genuinely appreciated but yes i have to say it once again thank you so much for coming on george thank you for having me it's been fun